All right. uh, <clears throat> it's difficult to talk about ice sheets without uh, talking about sea level. So this is my little introduction on sea level and why NISAR is relevant to sea level. Uh, sea level has been changing about 120 years through the ice ages, and if you compare that with the temperature record, you know that one degree of change in temperature uh, raises sea level by 20 meters. So if we raise the temperature of the Earth by a couple of degrees, we are up to 40 meters sea level, if you believe these numbers. Uh, and there's been times in the recent past where sea level was rising uh, 10 times faster than present. Uh, what's sea level for 2100? Uh, the IPCC uh, has projections. Uh, some of these projections are evolving. You see that they've been evolving into lower projection until the last report. The projections are going up, mostly because we have observations now to point out that the models have deficiencies. Um, but still, uh, in 2013, most of the models uh, disagree with the experts' opinion. Uh, IPCC projects uh, uh, 20 to 60 centimeters of sea level rise by 2100. Uh, the ice sheets could easily add 40 to 100 centimeters, and they're already on pace for 80 centimeters. So, um, <clears throat> to look at the contribution of ice sheets uh, to sea level, it's absolutely fundamental to look at ice motion. Uh, ice motion controls the flow of ice towards the sea margins uh, and expresses the impact of climate change. Uh, <clears throat> we are also using um, uh, gravity data from the GRACE mission and altimetry data to look at ice sheets and mass balance. Uh, GRACE is extremely useful to look at the mass change, but uh, does that at coarse resolution that does not provide information on ice dynamics. Altimetry um, is providing information about the places that are changing, but not necessarily indicative of a change in motion. Uh, what we really want to measure is the change in speed of the glaciers, which is the means by which ice sheets are going to raise sea level uh, very quickly. Now, for historical reasons, uh, a lot of emphasis is placed on using altimetry because this was the easier thing to achieve with satellites. Uh, you just have to measure the position of the satellite with respect to the Earth. Uh, we only know how to do gravity from space because of the advent of new technology and GPS, and same thing for ice velocity from space. But um, we have to pause a minute on that and reflect on the fact that uh, altimetry may be um, more used for <coughs> ice sheet mass balance for histori historical reasons, but maybe not necessarily for practical reasons. Uh, why is it hard to predict ice sheets? Uh, <coughs> a lot of the record on ice sheets disappeared. We, we don't have a record of how fast marine ice sheets can retreat because this has been bulldozed by uh, re-advance, so we don't have any idea how fast these ice sheets can retreat. Um, a lot of the boundaries that are critical to study them are invisible to the naked eye. They are occurring below kilometers of ice at the base of the ice or below the floating ice in the ocean and not even in the surface layers, but uh, 100 meters uh, below the surface. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, observations of ice dynamics have been acquired recently from, uh, from satellites, but we still have sparse observations, and evidence for marine ice sheet instability is, is also very recent uh, in a history of uh, looking at these ice sheets. Uh, <clears throat> we are moving towards um, higher order models that uh, couple the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, these models are new, and they're not very well constrained. And to put this in context, I used a uh, quotation from David Vaughan, who said uh, it's very difficult to predict uh, the meteorology if you don't have weather observations. And this is a little bit what we have uh, for ice sheets. Uh, <coughs> we've been uh, able to um, map uh, ice motion in Antarctica. The, the map is fairly recent, from 2011. This is the result of uh, an enormous effort uh, using six satellites, four space agencies collaborating for about six years to make sure we could collect the data to fill in um, uh, all the holes around the Antarctic. So this was very exciting, but at the same time, we know that uh, we would like to do this again. We would like to monitor the evolution of ice with time instead of just making uh, one map, and this is especially important for uh, numerical models. Uh, some of the data that we've used um, in the past, in particular for this map, result from a number of satellites. Uh, <coughs> many of these satellites are no longer available. Uh, the only one left is RadarSat2, which is a commercial venture. 
We have a lot of help from our Canadian friends to um, get more acquisitions, uh, in particular in the Antarctic and Greenland, from Redarsat 2, but it's done in a campaign style mode. Uh, there's also uh, new satellites coming around, TRSR and Tandemx, which have proven very useful. A little bit of data from Cosmos SkyMed as well. Uh, <coughs> these data are not available in large quantities and they are geographically limited. Um, it would be um, <coughs> hopeful to have more access to this data in the future. Uh, what we're looking at down the line is um, ELOS 2, which has been launched recently, and we'll hear more about that uh, uh, a little bit later on. The main science objectives of ELOS 2 are the carbon cycle and uh, earthquake cycle, uh, not necessarily ice sheets. So uh, data acquisition on the ice sheets will be limited, but our Japanese friends are making the best effort to provide some of these data. We have Sentinel launched also recently. Uh, with a uh, 12-day repeat, up to six days when Sentinel-B is up. Uh, the mission is currently operating on campaign-style mode, so there's not um, a lot of chance to have long time series of, of glacier data with this mission, but this might change with time. We have the RadarSat constellation, which is going to be put up uh, in space very soon, but as an Antarctic focus, it will not provide the good coverage of the Antarctic. Uh, Cosmos, SkyMed, and TerraSAR I just mentioned about and NISAR will operate at Airband, which has been proven to offer higher coherence level for the data. A fast repeat, uh, data will be uh, unlimited access, and uh, almost every cycle will acquire data uh, over the ice sheets. It has right and left looking and can map grounding lines. I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So with NISAR we, uh, and the existing SAR satellites, we hope to look at very important processes taking place in the ice sheets. Uh, marine instability taking place in uh, Jakob Savin, uh, where the glacier retreated more in five years than in the past 50 years, and is now speeding up and showing signs of uh, seasonal fluctuations that did not exist before. Uh, just as recently as uh, this year, in the northeast of Greenland, we've seen the birth of a Tidewater Glacier. This glacier used to flow in an ice shelf and it's now falling apart and calving into the ocean. Um, there's actually few uh, INSAR data to look at this process which is happening right now. Um, if we had an INSAR mission, we would be able to monitor that almost real time. Uh, in the Antarctic, we sort of missed the collapse of uh, the Larsen B ice shelf. In 2014, if it would happen tomorrow, we probably missed it too because we don't have uh, enough satellite coverage to capture some of the dynamic changes taking place uh, uh, over here. And some of these changes were quite significant. These glaciers upstream of the ice shelf sped up by a factor eight in response to the collapse of Larsen B. Uh, with uh, NISAR, we'll be also to map grounding lines more extensively and, and, and monitor them. The grounding line is the transition boundary between continental ice and floating ice. It's a very fragile, uh, very precise boundary where the ice meets the ocean and is uh, discharged into the ocean to raise sea level. It's also an area very important for modelers because it controls the level of uh, basal resistance of the glaciers as they flow down to sea. When this boundary migrates, it has a very important impact uh, on the glacier flow. So it's important to monitor it very well. We can do that with NISARS extremely well within 100 meters because we have so much vertical precision in the mapping of uh, motion on, on the ice. Uh, it's an order of magnitude better than what can be done with uh, laser altimetry of, with visible imagery. So with NISAR, we'll be able to do this not just once, but repeat it over time and see the dynamics of these grounding lines. One area which is particularly important is the Pine Island sector where we have grounding lines of retreating at kilometer per year. In one area, we actually saw a grounding line retreating uh, 37 kilometers in 11 years. Uh, but uh, we haven't been able to map these grounding lines uh, in details except on five different years. Uh, on two occasions, uh, it was only thanks to the generosity of uh, mission managers that we could actually access the data. Uh, um, otherwise, we would not have any idea what happened between 96 and present. And since 2011, we have actually no capability to continue monitoring the grounding lines because the instruments that could uh, do it uh, do not acquire data uh, and, and the other instruments cannot cope with the rate of, of motion of these glaciers. So we've Nice are up in the air, we'll be able to look at uh, these grounding lines on a weekly basis. 
Uh, there are some large changes taking place in this area that are very important to monitor. Uh, it's an area of potentially very visible retreat where uh, sea level could raise one meter within a period that's short of a century. It could be two centuries or nine centuries also, depends on the models. But at least one study showed that it could be done in one century. So it's extremely important to be able to keep a, a, an eye on what's going on in this part of uh, uh, Antarctica. Uh, this is a map of uh, basal friction, which is uh, uh, the result uh, of work by Morrigan et al. Uh, using uh, NASA resources, uh, the ISSM uh, model, and the Pleiade cluster. Uh, this is uh, a map inferred at a kilometer resolution. It's the first time that we can look at basal friction underneath the ice sheet. All these areas in red show areas where the ice is sliding very fast. Uh, there's no basal friction. And we see that uh, these areas are quite extensive. And the big question again is, uh, can we repeat that? And um, to repeat that is an immense effort. And um, NISA will be able to provide the data to make these calculations more repeatable with time so that we can answer the big question of uh, whether this basal friction can change with time or not. Uh, with uh, ice motion, we can also improve our mapping of uh, the bathymetry of the glaciers how deep they are below sea level and how far upstream they stay below sea level. We can complement the existing ice thickness data by using ice motion vectors to produce high resolution map of ice thickness. We can look at ice shelf melt around Antarctica, uh, which is a little bit like the Canaries in the coal mine, uh, because once these ice shelves start melting and disintegrate, we know that the glaciers are gonna speed up and the ice sheet is gonna raise sea level much faster. So we know about this area that can contribute one meter. There could be some other areas uh, looming at the horizon. And uh, <clears throat> with NISAR and the data, we'll be able to figure out which fuse is going to go up next. This is some of the coverage that was presented in the first talk in the Antarctic. Uh, we can have high temporal sampling, very high precision. Uh, we can have a left looking mode to fill in uh, the South Pole area. And the same thing in Greenland. It's going to be affected a little bit by the right-looking mode, but there's plenty of coverage in Greenland. Mapping of ice motion within a meter per year and grounding lines within 100 meters uh, every 12 days. Uh, <coughs> so the contribution to the strategy of NISARV is just a few. I'm sure there's going to be more once we fly the mission and make a lot of exciting discoveries. But uh, we're going to have continuous observations of ice sheet dynamics. We're going to be able to make major advances in processes that require frequent acquisitions, such as iceberg calving. Uh, we need frequent data to see these fast processes. The collapse of an ice shelf, we've not been able to make maps of ice motion during a, a map, an episode of uh, ice shelf collapse. Looking at grinding line dynamics, which is really important for models, and short time flow dynamics and changes in basal friction. Uh, <clears throat> this will provide an advanced warning system for ice sheets and ice shelves in addition to the altimetry missions that are flying right now. Uh, <clears throat> often we've been asked, you know, uh, how much a NISA will help us reduce uncertainty in sea level. I think the counter argument is that if we don't have a mission like NISA, we will not be able to reduce the sea level projection, uh, the uncertainties in sea level projections. They will remain unacceptably high. Uh, with better models, coupled with the ocean and atmosphere, uh, the large goal uh, down the line is to be able to narrow down the probability of catastrophic ice sheet retreat uh, in some of these ice sheets from ever-increasing carbon emissions not controlled by our fierce leaders. Thank you very much.